Mexico bid call for speaker is open. Leverage this time to submit your presentations. And we have a tons of community. This is our community. We also have SQL Saturday. We have Boston this Saturday. I'll be in Boston. If you're going to be in, in, in Boston, why not? Stop by and say hi, and I'll be happy to meet you in person. Right? We have uh, also Microsoft Meetup that I would highly suggest you to join this group. The reason why I'm saying this because it has a tons of global user group, even though if it's online or in person, it's going to be hard for you not to find a user group that near you or fits your need because they have online uh, user group as well. And then, uh, you know, uh, Mike, before I start working for Microsoft, Microsoft Learn used to be my way to go. The second one is YouTube. So therefore, I would highly suggest you to leverage Microsoft Learn. This is a community, right? And it has a tons of no information regarding Microsoft product. Feel free to add that as your favorite um, uh, URL. We have a tons of uh, um, a session light up, and the next two one we have Katy. She's gonna talk about post is SQL, right? Flexible server. I would highly suggest you to join this presentation. And we also have um, Turashu. Uh, she's gonna walk us uh, to pass back that SQL manager. So that would be another great session, right? But if you do want to speak. For now, you have uh, this email. This email is not useful anymore. Uh, we are working to create a group instead. But what you can do, you can reach out to me, Kevin, or reach out to, for example, Wonen, and we will schedule you. Is the thing. Uh, today, we have uh, Ralph Randolph, right? He is uh, a senior content developer at Microsoft. And he's a speaker, blogger. Um, uh, he will uh, share his experience and knowledge uh, regarding database administration through the ages. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have all of you one more time and to have for the first time in our user group meeting, Randolph. And this is an honor to have you, Randolph. Feel free to introduce yourself. Start uh, with the presentation. In the meantime, I'm about to start um, uh, uh, the recording. I would suggest you to, for example, share your screen if you don't mind. Yeah. Introduce yourself. I will do so. Oh, oh, okay, perfect. So great. So it's already uh, perfect. Great. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I love that you have so many wonderful speakers that are coming through your user group. We had one in Calgary, which was not very well attended. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that you're continuing yours. And uh, Ronan, on behalf of uh, Microsoft, we'd like to send our best wishes to you as well. So thank you everyone for that wonderful introduction. My name is Randolph West. Today I'm going to be talking to you about database administration through the ages, or really what it means to be a database administrator in 2023, because job titles change, but what does it actually mean now with all the new technology that's flying around? The good news, once I've introduced myself and told you I've written some books, is that I work for Microsoft on the do uh, database docs team, and uh, we have been looking at a lot of new stuff coming in, including Fabric, we'll talk very, briefly about Fabric in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and the main thing is that database administrator as, a, as, an, as an idea, as a role, as a, as a job title has changed. There's no doubt about it because you, you can call yourself a DBA, but what does that actually mean? So in recent years, probably the last five or so years, I've been using the term a data professional because it's more encompassing of what it is that we do from day to day as opposed to the usual backup and restore thing that that production DBAs used to be known for. So when I think of a DBA these days, the first thing that I do in my head is I substitute DBA for data professional because of the broadness of scope that that, that entails. 
So what does that actually mean? What does a data professional do? Well, I'm going to go through a list of things that I found on Wikipedia because I'm lazy, but the things that a production DBA normally does. So installing, upgrading, migrating, configuring, resource and capacity management, knowing how to do query tuning, data security, user security, and compliance. Those are, I mean, I read the slide, you can read the slide too. Those are the, the fairly standard ideas of what a DBA is today. And it also is about managing high availability. It's about query queries for reporting and analysis. It's about dealing with customers and that's internal and external. So your customers could be paying customers from the outside who use your systems, or they could be internal colleagues, they could be different departments, things like that. So dealing with customers is a big deal for DBAs and, and, and data professionals. Sorry, you see, I just did it there. Uh, data professionals often in the old days were known for saying no all the time or because they didn't want anybody touching their systems. Dealing with customers these days has to be a, a much more nuanced approach. And of course, I said they're monitoring the data estate. What is a data estate? Everything to do with data. What is data? Well, it's not just your SQL Server anymore. And that's why it's important when you worry and think about things in the future and how your job is going to be safe, that a lot of the same principles apply, whether it be structured data in a SQL Server database or an Oracle database or MySQL or Postgres or Access. Yes, Access still exists. There's a lot of things out there that you need to know, that you need to be able to understand, that you need to manage while you're going forward into this into this bold new world of, of services and, and uh, internet and cloud and all that kind of thing. But the same principles apply throughout. So what does a data professional know? All the stuff that we spoke about before, you need to also know how to do database theory and design. So if you need to create a new table and need to create columns and choose the right data types and all that kind of thing. I did a session yesterday for another user group about how SQL Server stores data types. And you can go back and look at that if you, if you want your brain to melt, but it's about making sure that you choose the right design and you've got to know all of this. You've got to know how to do all the other stuff. You've got to think about the future. You've got to know how to do queries. You've got to know internals quite well. But the good news is it's not all bad, I promise you. Knowing SQL is good. Knowing distributed computing architecture is good. Knowing where the, the client is, where the server is, if you've got three tier architecture or more, where you've got an application server, that's a very 1990s way of thinking. These days you've got your internet client that connects to a database service. So a lot of that abstraction has removed some of the concerns for you. So although it's good to know these things, you don't have to know everything, but it's good to know the principles and we'll get into that. So you might know operating systems I'm presenting to you on a Mac right now. Uh, storage technologies and networking, you need to know that kind of stuff as well. One of the questions that um, I was asked earlier is how I take questions. You can interrupt me anytime. This is a conversation. I don't have any demos because why would I, if I'm talking to you about new and future things? So if you have a question for me, please interrupt me. I don't have the chat visible on my screen. So if uh, somebody wants to interrupt me and, and speak and ask their question, please feel free. So this one, when I say please come off mute, I don't mean for this question, but I'd like to find out from the group, uh, generally speaking, which versions of SQL Server you've used. Not ones that you're using right now, but which ones you've ever used. So that can be six, 6.5, 7, 2000, all the way up to 2022, plus the Azure stuff, plus the Linux stuff, plus the IoT stuff uh, with SQL Edge. So just think about that for uh, for a couple of seconds there, and uh, we'll go on to the next slide very shortly. But just think about what versions you've used and how much knowledge you actually have without realizing it. And by the way, if you're joining this user group session and you've never used SQL Server, that's okay. What data systems have you used that manage data? That can be a data lake, which is unstructured data thrown into a, a storage area, and you've had to use Excel and uh, Power Query and all the, that kind of stuff to get data out. All that analysis stuff still counts. When we talk about uh, Microsoft Fabric, which is, I'm not being paid by Microsoft to talk about Microsoft Fabric, that's not my area, but I want you as data analysts to also uh, understand that although this is more SQL Server focused, data analysis doesn't just come from 
the data stored in the database, it comes from everywhere. And I recognize that. And it's good that you recognize that too. So now that you've thought about which versions of SQL Server you've used, this is a list I put together that is the ones that I can think of. People watching this who are familiar with SQL Server have used. I started with 6.5, uh, and that was the last version of SQL Server that was still based on the Sybase code base for SQL Server before Microsoft rewrote the database engine for version 7. So if you are familiar with any of these things, you probably started, if you're as old as I am, around 6.5 or 2000 era. You may have skipped 7 because it had a few bugs. We're not too shy to admit that when you rewrite a database engine, it might have some bugs. But if you know SQL Server now, you'll also know that SQL Server 7 is when the 8 kilobyte data page came out. That's where they made the decisions about collations and default collations and stuff like that. A lot of the things we do today in SQL Server 2022, in Azure SQL Database, in SQL Managed Instance, in containers, and all that kind of stuff comes from 7. So if you've used SQL Server since that time, chances are very good that you're using stuff that is probably considered old or ancient or antique, but that's good. And that I'll explain why that's good. So of course, as a Microsoft employee, I have to tell you that Microsoft doesn't support anything that is out of support, obviously. Stuff that is old, you need to move on to the new train, give Microsoft some more money, buy services in the cloud, subscriptions and all those things. But even though a lot of these things are no longer in use, the products that we are looking at today are just SQL Server. It's the same thing that you've worked with before. There might be a few new features here and there, but if you understand the principles of data design, if you understand the principles of data analysis, if you understand the principles of queries, then it's just the same thing. The way that you access it might be slightly different, but the principles are the same. <coughs> Excuse me. So, moving on to the principles. Did you know that there are one billion, that's one with nine zeros, nanoseconds in one second. That means if you're counting nanoseconds, it's going to take you 32 years to count out to 1 billion out loud. I'm not kidding. If you say 1, 2, 3, and you go all the way up to 1 billion, it's about 30 years for you to count that, that far out loud. And uh, there's 1 billion of those in every second. So when we talk about milliseconds, microseconds, those are very big numbers compared to nanoseconds is 1 billion nanoseconds in one second. And that matters because at the CPU scale, a nanosecond is not very long at all. So I have a chart here that I think you'd like. This chart is in nanoseconds. This is comparing a CPU cycle, uh, L1 cache, L2 cache in a CPU, L3 cache if some CPUs have it, DDR access, which is for RAM, uh, Optane PMIM, which is an Intel technology for persistent memory, I've got Optane SSD as well there for NVMe SSD, normal SSD, a regular hard drive, and a ping time from Manhattan to Calgary. So because the Calgary Manhattan ping time of 55.3 milliseconds is destroying this chart, we're going to have to remove some things so that this chart makes any sense because all these numbers are down here are at such a small scale. Even this SSD at 100,000 nanoseconds for a single read compared to a CPU cycle of, let's say, a, a regular four gigahertz CPU cycle, these numbers are so massive on the side of, on the right side that we have to remove them from the chart, otherwise it's, it's meaningless. So let's go on to the next slide. And here we have a slightly better scale. I've taken away almost everything. Ex well, I've taken away the, the hard drive and, and the ping time, so now we have a more easy to use chart, but again, you'll see 100,000 nanoseconds for an SSD versus a CPU cycle, which is 0.4 nanoseconds. I want you to appreciate, and it's not easy to appreciate this, how quick one nanosecond is. If a four gigahertz CPU cycle is, is ticking over at one four billionth of a second, yes, that's right, so 0.4, then the rest of everything, it's just waiting around for, for things to happen. It's waiting around a very, very, very long time. Now I've got a link at the bottom left here, which is a computer latency at a human scale, which you can look at in time. 
after the session, preferably because I'm still speaking and I like the sound of my voice. But what I want you to understand is if you were to convert a single CPU cycle into a human scale, in other words, one second, if you imagine that a CPU is ticking over once every second, that four gigahertz CPU that is ticking over at one tick or one clock cycle every second, then we can extrapolate out these other values at the bottom here and understand at a human scale how fast a CPU is, how slow a network is, and why that matters as a data professional in 2023. Here is a human scale chart showing you what I've just explained, a CPU cycle at 0.4 nanoseconds. If we equate that to one second, then level one cache access, which is RAM on CPU die, is two seconds. It's double. It takes double the time for a, for a clock cycle to wait for level one cache access. So the CPU has to tick over twice before it'll get information back from level one cache. If it's doing RAM access, now you're talking four minutes that the CPU is waiting if a single clock cycle is one second. That is a significant amount of time to wait. NVMe access, which is the fastest storage we currently have, 17 hours. If a CPU ticks over once every second, it's waiting 17 hours for that data to come from disk. That is, that is mind boggling. And that is why a microsecond, when we talk about microseconds and nanoseconds and milliseconds, it's difficult to appreciate just how huge the difference in size is between the CPU cycle and everything else. So let's look here. We've got SSD, three days. We've got a LAN ping, one millisecond, which is quick. It's really quick. SQL Server likes two milliseconds for a data write on a transaction log. We're talking about one to two months if the CPU ticks over once every second. That is just mind boggling. There's no other way to describe that. At a human scale, I hope you can now appreciate why the network matters and why it matters how far you are as your user from your data how far your customers are from your application and how all of that matters when it comes to building new systems for the cloud, building systems that are migrating to uh, cloud-based stuff, or maybe you wanna keep hosting your stuff internally. All of these things take you should take into account when you're considering this because a Manhattan to Calgary ping time is four and a half years. Any questions so far? I need to take a drink of water. No, uh, the threat is uh, still clear. Okay, no, no problems. Moving on. All righty. Let's talk a little bit about the CPU, this monster of performance that sits inside your, maybe it's your database server on your internal uh, network, or it might be the CPU that's running inside a virtual machine in the cloud. A CPU, a central processing unit, is one or more physically distinct processing units on the same die. The same die meaning when you look at a CPU, it's it's plastic with some pins or places for pins to make contact on one side. And then on the other side, you've got the little CPU and you can scrape it off, scrape off the, the protected covering and you'll see a little CPU that is tinier than my fingernail, my, my pinky fingernail. And then all these little copper wires or gold wires that are connecting those to the pins so that the computer can use the CPU. But it's physically distinct processing units on the same die. For SQL Server and other database servers, single threaded performance is more important than what Intel calls hyperthreading for OLTP. So if you're looking at single threaded performance versus multi-core or hyperthreading, and we'll talk about that just now, single threaded performance is more important for OLTP. If it can get something done much faster on a single thread, that's the preferred option. So you can have a CPU with multiple cores. You can have a CPU with multiple sockets, which is multiple physical CPUs. But your single threaded performance when you're buying a CPU or renting a CPU by the hour in the cloud, if you can get a higher single threaded score, then your SQL Server is going to perform much better. And in SQL Server 2016 and the newer versions, they've been doing this as well. The new Mac stop options are available in setup in Windows while you're installing the product. Mac stop stands for maximum degree of parallelism. 
What that means is if you've got a multi-core system, maxed up is a setting where you can say, okay, if I've got 32 cores in my CPU, reserve a set number of those cores for multi for multi-threaded queries so that we can leave some of the CPU uh, cores free to do single-threaded stuff. So maximum degree of parallelism. Eric Darling has just done a presentation about it on, on his blog, uh, Darling Data. Um, he did a video as well to, to demonstrate the, the fun with maxed up. You need to be careful when you're setting the setting, but the defaults that come with uh, SQL Server 2017 and higher, I think, are good enough for starting out, and then you can go and test and, and tweak those settings accordingly. So let's talk about hyperthreading, which is what Intel calls it. Simultaneous multi-threading, or SMT, is a little bit of extra headroom on a CPU. It's not a second processor. Don't be fooled by the marketing. And I say that working for a company that's known for its marketing. Intel created this extra headroom. So if a CPU runs out of capacity, there's a little bit of extra, maybe 15% when it comes to SQL Server that you can use on a hyperthreading core. Don't think of a hyperthreading core as a second CPU because it isn't. It really, really isn't in this context because SQL Server has a very particular way of accessing CPUs. And even at the nanosecond scale, remember we spoke about nanoseconds right at the beginning, even at that scale, if your CPU is running in power saving mode, it may take too long for the CPU to ramp up before SQL Server has finished its query. SQL Server uses the CPU th threads and cores very efficiently. So if you're thinking about using hyperthreading, don't think of it for the wrong reasons. Think of it for the right reasons. Don't think, well, not, I've got a 32 core machine, but in fact, it's only 16 cores, especially if it's virtualized. If you've got a virtual CPU, that means you might be accessing hyperthreading cores, but the virtualization layer has presented them as second cores and suddenly your performance is terrible. This is why you need to make sure that if you're setting up a virtual machine with vCPUs and hyperthreading enabled, that you don't allocate it in, uh, incorrectly. And in fact, if you're a one or two person team that is running a whole data estate, maybe turn off hyperthreading entirely for your database servers. And this is why. I mentioned Intel a lot because they came up with the idea of hyperthreading. AMD has the same concept as well. And in fact, they call it SMT, it was uh, simultaneous multi-threading. AMD used to be sl much slower than Intel, especially with multi-core CPUs, but Ryzen has changed that game. And Ryzen's been around, what, five, seven years now, so it doesn't really matter anymore. In fact, in the old days, you could get a discount on your core uh, licensing for SQL Server if you had an AMD CPU because it was slower, but now it's not anymore and that, that has gone away. The important thing with CPUs, and I mentioned it before, always disable power saving settings for your CPU. If you're paying thousands of dollars per core for a SQL Server license, especially for Enterprise Edition, and we're talking about $8,000. If your CPU has to ramp up because it's saving power, SQL Server might be finished that query, but it would have run a lot slower than it would have if power saving was off. So if you're using SQL Server on a machine that costs you a lot of money and SQL Server costs a lot of money, make sure the power saving is off so that you can make the best use of that machine. Any questions about CPU? And it's okay if you don't have any questions now, you'll have questions later, it's okay. If not, let's move on. Let's talk about RAM or memory, random access memory. I mentioned the max degree of parallelism, parallelism earlier, and that's not the same thing as max server memory. Max degree of parallelism comes with CPUs and uh, max server memory comes with memory. Max server memory setting in SQL Server by default is set to 2.1 petabytes. Now, in the same way that we spoke about nanoseconds and milliseconds being very different, a megabyte, a gigabyte, a terabyte, are very different to a petabyte. A petabyte is a very, very, very big number. It's 2.1 billion somethings or trillion, or I don't know. It's such a big number. It's I, it's it's huge. That's the default setting for max server memory. So until we get machines with more than 2.1 petabytes of RAM, it means that SQL Server is gonna use all your memory. 
That's the way it's designed. I'm talking about enterprise edition because uh, standard edition is limited. 228 gigabytes for the, for the buffer pool. But for enterprise edition, if you've got or even a machine with less than, than the, the maximum that's um, standard edition supports, it's going to use all your memory. It's designed to do that because as you saw in that first chart, a memory access is, what was it, four, four, four minutes versus one second? It's much better than the, than the couple of days that you're waiting for storage access. So SQL Server puts as much as it can into memory. That makes sense. So if you've got a massive database and not enough memory, you're going to be doing a lot of reads from disk and, and flushing out the buffer pool. In other words, every time you read from the buffer pool, you might flush that out because something else needs to be in the buffer pool now. So this is something important when you're designing your systems. This is why indexes matter. It's why you don't want to have queries that run with a like query with a percent on both sides because then it cannot use a, a proper index. Indexes matter because that means you have less data in memory, which means SQL Server will be faster. This matters as a DBA or a data professional or whatever sort of data person you are in 2023 as much as it did 30 years ago. The less you can have in memory, the faster your system will be. And SQL Server wants to put as much as it can in memory. Now, max server memory is relating to the buffer pool. Um, column store in memory objects, those are features that Microsoft added recently. I say recently because I've been using this for 30 years. It, it's, it's more recent than other stuff that, that we've mentioned, but column store and in memory objects have their own addressable memory over and above the max server memory setting or the buffer pool. So it's all part of the buffer pool, but it's it's different sections. So if you've got, let's say, standard edition and you've got 256 gigabytes of memory in the physical machine or the virtual machine, you can have your limit of 128 for the buffer pool, and then you can have extra memory for column store and in-memory objects. That's good to know. If you're using Linux and SQL Server runs on Linux, it has run on Linux since 2017, if you are running on Linux, make sure that you don't overcommit the amount of memory that you have for SQL Server because Linux, which is a completely different operating model than Windows for, as an operating system, it will force kill a, a process or a or SQL Server or anything that is that uses more memory than it should. It will just terminate the process completely. And if you had anything important in there, now you have to go through crash recovery. There's nothing you can do about it except not overcommit. So by default, Linux, uh, SQL Server on Linux, uh, limits the amount of memory, the physical memory you can have available to you to 80%. So max server memory is important to set lower than your physical limits so that you don't use all the memory. And on Linux, they're, they're protecting you by having that at 80% automatically. Just like there was a uh, CPU settings in the SQL Server setup program on Windows, you also have max server memory options as well. And that will, and this is only at install time. So be careful about this. If you're installing a VM and you ramp it up to the highest possible machine size that you can so that you can get the installation done quickly, and then it sets max server memory for you and it sets the max stop setting for you, and then you scale down that machine, then you're going to use all your memory again. And the opposite is true for if you've set up your machine at a certain size, and then sometimes during the month you might increase the size of the VM so that you can have more capacity for, for a, an expensive business operation, you will also have to manipulate your max server memory option then as well. So keep that in mind as well. Any questions about memory so far? Yes, there is a question from Bruce. Uh, what about the uh, mean memory best practice? Can we keep a uh, mean memory to zero all the time? Actually, you already answered part of it, so uh, if you want to respond, uh, the question continue. I see some uh, people always uh, want to set up a value uh, for mean, mem mean memory to hold uh, some uh, fixed amount of memory. Is that good practice? So in memory is a, is a very interesting technology to work with. Um, 
you have to test. And I say you have to test, and this is not a cop out on my part. And when I say it depends, again, this is not a cop out on my part. When you're dealing with in-memory objects, you need to keep in mind that that SQL Server needs to create internal objects over and above the data you're putting into your in-memory objects. So it has to create internal support things to, to uh, mix between the, the regular objects and the in-memory objects. And that can need up to four times the size of memory for that in-memory object. So if you've got an in-memory table that is 10 gigs, you need to allocate 40 gigs to that object so that the other 20 to 30 gigs is available for Microsoft to create the in-memory and the, the internal structures to handle that. So what happens is a lot of people get caught out by in-memory blue screening their system because suddenly they're out of memory. And it's because, and the documentation does say this, you need to allocate a lot more memory than you think. So with in-memory objects, be careful, test. They are useful, they do have a function, they're very good for certain things. But if you're thinking, I've got SQL Server Enterprise Edition and I've got two terabytes of RAM, then use in memory. But if you've got standard edition and you've only got 128 or 256 gigs of RAM and you think that in memory is a good idea, chances are it's not. Chances are you can make other optimizations in your, in your database design that would benefit you in a far more flexible way than in memory will. Because when you create an in memory database, you cannot ever turn it off. Once it's on, it is on permanently. The only exception to this is when you're using in-memory objects in tempdb, which I do encourage. That's a feature in 2019 and 2022 that, it, that was enhanced where your tempdb objects are in memory. And in that case, do turn it on because every time you restart your machine or every time tempdb goes down in crash recovery and gets recreated, it, it's, it's fine then. But be careful with in-memory. Yes, Ronan, I see your face. Uh, I didn't talk to you because it's great uh, information regarding in memory, but just to uh, clarify, probably it was my accent. It wasn't a question about in memory. It was a, it was a question about min memory. Mini memory. Minimum. Ah, well, you know what? So you just learned things. That's good. I understood uh, that uh, great uh, information. That's that. Well, I'm I'm happy to share. I could talk to you for hours. So max server memory. Yes, you should set that. You should always change that. I would not change min server memory. I would leave it at the default of I think it's 16 megabytes. Don't change it to match max server memory. That is not good advice. If you have had a support case with Microsoft and then they tell you to do that, that's not the same thing as me telling you not to do it. The only time you should set min server memory is if somebody from Microsoft on a support call has told you to do that. Otherwise, don't do it. Because if you start up SQL Server and it requires a whole bunch of memory and you're on a virtual machine and you've over, you've over allocated the memory because you've got a whole bunch of other things running on the same physical hardware and SQL cannot expand to that amount of memory or lock pages of memory isn't set and we'll talk about that later then you could crash the machine just because of that min server memory setting. So only set it if somebody in Microsoft support tells you to. Otherwise, don't bother. Max server memory is the thing you want to deal about. And by the way, you're welcome for the free unsolicited advice about in-memory as well. Cool. Let's talk a bit more about physical memory. Did you know that if you have, this is wild, you'll love this, if you have a DIM, so a direct in-memory module, um, that basically the, the physical plastic with the chips on it that, that you plug into your, into your um, hardware, into your motherboard, if the density of that is higher than 32 gigabytes, which it is in modern hardware, if the density of one of those chips is higher than 32 gigabytes, you are going to get cosmic rays flipping bits in your memory. You're going to because of the nature of the universe. So if you buy RAM for your server, you don't want that happening. You don't even want it happening for your desktop computer while you're while you're writing code for your for your application or your queries. You want to make sure that those cosmic rays, if they do flip bits from uh, plus to uh, from one to zero or zero to one, that the RAM can self-correct or error correct. So please use ECC RAM 
if you have more than 32 gigs in your machine. There's a simple rule for you. Use ECC RAM if you're going to have more than 32 gigs. Done. Lock pages in memory, I briefly touched on previously. Um, lock pages in memory is a contentious issue. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about this. Now, I happen with William Asaf on my team at Database Docs. I happen to be the person who wrote the most recent update with William on how to turn on or decide whether to use lock pages in memory. And we also wrote about it in, in one of the books that we that we put together for Microsoft Press. You can turn on lock pages in memory if you have a virtual machine and SQL Server is the only thing running on that VM. If you are guaranteed that no other process will come in and take over the memory, then by all means, turn it on. But if you're using a shared host, which has a bunch of other VMs on it, and you don't know what else is there, and you, you are going to suffer from a noisy neighbor, or in other words, another VM on the same host that uses more resources than it should, then you don't want to use lock pages in memory. Lock pages in memory, for those who don't know, is a policy in the Windows policy editor. It's not a setting in SQL Server. So do use it if you're on a physical machine or you're on a VM with only one thing running on it that is SQL Server. Because what it does is it keeps what it says, it keeps memory locked to that process. But if you've got oversubscription or you've overcommitted the, the host, you're going to have problems. It's going to blue screen. Any questions about memory? Uh, there was a question uh, regarding uh, auto memory tuning. Uh, the question is that the SQL Server has auto uh, memory tuning like uh, DB2. Okay. Is the question whether SQL is going to have it or if they do? No, it asks, uh, does uh, SQL Server have it? Uh, they're, they're not really, no. There used to be, you could pin tables in memory for older versions of SQL Server, but that doesn't do anything anymore. What what SQL Server does is it uses a an algorithm of most recently used data pages, because every data access in SQL Server is done through a data page, which is eight kilobytes in size, and it'll read it off disk into memory and put it in the buffer pool. And then it, it has a, a, a record of what pages were most recently accessed and it'll keep those in memory for a little bit longer. But there's no sort of auto memory tuning that I can think of. Um, there's index tuning, which you should probably use in, in the Azure side. But memory tuning, I'm not aware of anything. Ronan, do you know of anything? Because I don't. Oh, that was it. Uh, SQL Server does not have uh, any uh, dynamic uh, tuning of the memory, like the max uh, in memory. There is a built-in algorithm, uh, and uh, basically, other than this, it's our problem. Yeah, it is our uh, problem. I mean, Microsoft, Microsoft loves to give you flexibility, and that comes with making sure that you're monitoring these things. So if you're, if you're fairly new to SQL Server, this can be a surprise. And suddenly you've got, let's, like I mentioned before, if you, if you increase the size of your VM and your Mac server memory hasn't been changed, you need to do that yourself. So yeah, there's no dynamic tuning that, that is in the, in the product, and I cannot, even if I did know, I could not tell you if that was planned for the future. Yeah, but even if we had it, it wasn't uh, solve any of those problems. Take for example, uh, DB2 that was mentioned. It's not like if it, now I will change the amount of memory of the virtual machine, then suddenly, immediately, it will change the uh, server uh, memory because it's working uh, uh, about the history. It, it's like it's learning. So a feature of uh, changing uh, the memory dynamically can help us uh, if we don't know how to do it ourselves but it will not solve any of those problems, like uh, yeah, changing the virtual machine uh, memory. Yeah. There is another question. Uh, is there uh, some technique uh, documentation that uh, you point me to about the... Uh, uh, oh, sorry. I started with the one question and jumped to the other. Okay, again, uh, another question. Uh, how do you learn 
uh, what is log pages in memory. Uh, I do not think that Microsoft Learn explain it. Uh, if I may, I want to answer it because the answer is not related to this uh, session. It's a general. If you want to learn, in my opinion, and uh, we will hear from Wander or anyone with a, a different uh, opinion, I think that you need to learn from blogs and posts. Documentation is old. Until the documentation come up, believe me, there are blogs that already spoke about it a long time before it, because blogs and the posts from an uh, expert come during the preview. When a uh, SQL server has a new version, a new feature, then you will find the information. So, in my opinion, the best way is to follow user group meeting, because in user group, we bring uh, new uh, information in the lecture many times, and follow posts on paper that uh, you, you think that uh, can bring you the information. So on that, Ronan, thank you for raising the documentation. So the SQL Server documentation, I'm going to take a little bit of a sidetrack here. Um, I'm on the team that that handles the SQL Server documentation and the Azure SQL documentation. For your reference, there are 16,000, that's one six, 16,000 articles that we have to look after. And there's only seven of us plus our manager. That's more articles than any eight people can look after. It's just too much there. And we have to maintain that and we have to be privy to all the new stuff coming in. We have to maintain old content as well. So to Ronan's point, if you want to look about, if you want to look at things that um, the documentation doesn't have or is uh, the, where the documentation is old, then definitely look at at, at uh, blogs and go to and, and user group sessions. There's a lot of stuff um, out there that is not just on the documentation. So thank you for bringing that up, Ronan. Ronan, in fact, has has contributed to the to the database docs from time to time, so we appreciate that. All right, I'm moving on because yeah. of time. Okay, continue. We will go over the question after. Yeah. Uh, of course. So let's talk a little bit about storage. So here's my little picture of two data pages next to each other. What is persisted storage? Well, this is a fairly new concept where your memory, remember I mentioned the DIM, the thing that plugs into the into the motherboard, that is your, your memory. Persisted storage now says, okay, on one side of that, of that little piece of plastic, we're gonna have the memory, and on the other side, we're gonna have solid state storage. So the storage is there to protect the memory, kind of. Kind of. That's, um, we talk about that here with persistent memory. So when I talk about persisted storage, we're talking about solid state. We're not talking about spinning drives. Remember, remember those spinning drives. We call them magnetic disks or um, um, uh, spinning rust nowadays. Solid state has CPUs, not CPUs, sorry. I'm going to start again. Solid state has, has chips on plastic again um, with... Uh, no seek time. In other words, there's no spinning. There's no head on top of the on top of the the spinning thing that says, "Okay, I'm looking for where the track is. I'm looking for where the data is." So it stops spinning. It finds the thing and then it reads it from there. Spins some more. That the head moves. All of that seek time is gone with solid state storage because every single cell on the chip is addressable from the beginning. So it knows that the data is in cell 25 and let's say column three. I'm just making that up but it knows exactly where it is, so it knows to go and get that data straight away. So solid state is faster than spinning storage by virtue of the fact that there's no seek time. However, there are other complications with solid state that we'll talk about a little bit. When you test storage devices that are solid state, you need to test them where you have a large block size. SQL Server has a 64 kilobyte extent, but it stores everything in eight kilobyte pages. So when SQL Server reads from the disk or writes to the disk, it writes in those 64 kilobyte extents, even though the data itself is an eight kilobyte page. So you want to test your IOPS or input output per second with a larger block size so that you can test how SQL Server is going to perform. It doesn't help testing with a 512 byte block size if you're testing the performance. 
because when you have a larger block size, it can cause basically a queue. Um, you'll have something waiting for something else. And that disk queue depth can only go to a certain amount of time before the memory on, on the SSD is going to slow down and, and cause, cause uh, contention. So always, always get faster storage that you can and turn off antivirus. I'm going to stare at the camera ominously as I say, turn off your antivirus for SQL Server, please. We actually released, when I say we, I mean Microsoft. Microsoft released a new article about the antivirus management for SQL Server. You need to turn off where your SQL Server storage is. You need to, these are exclusions in Microsoft Defender and other antiviruses. So you need to exclude where the data files are stored. You need to exclude where the log files are stored. You need to exclude the SQL Server process. You need to exclude the log writing process. You need to uh, exclude agent. You need to exclude SSIS if you're running it. You need to exclude SSAS. You need to exclude the SQL Server executable. You need to exclude a bunch of stuff. If you don't do that, your antivirus is going to make your machine slow because your antivirus is doing what it's supposed to do. It's reading. Every time something gets written to disk, it's going to read and make sure that that's not a virus. But SQL Server has a very efficient algorithm for writing to disk where it bypasses a couple of the default NTFS rules. And the antivirus might see that as, as virus behavior. So please turn off your malware detection with SQL Server and make sure that you're protecting your machine in other ways. But make sure that, please turn off your antivirus for SQL Server, just do it. I spoke briefly about persistent memory. I'll get back to the hyperconvert, don't worry. Persistent memory is where you've got your, your, your RAM and you've got your SSD on the same hardware that you plug into your motherboard. And if something happens to your machine and it loses power, the persistent memory has its own power supply and it can write directly to memory. It doesn't have to write to the hard drive because it's always in memory. The memory is backed by its own power supply. So if something happens to your machine, everything that was in memory is still in memory. SQL Server can now detect on more recent versions, uh, 2017 and higher on Windows and 2019 on Linux, where if you've got persistent memory, it never goes to the heart, to the storage layer because it doesn't need to. So if you've got a database that's small enough to fit in memory and you've got persistent memory, it can scream. It is very, very fast. That is cool stuff. Hyperconverged infra infrastructure you may have heard of. That's where you have your, your um, multiple pieces of hardware plugging together in a modular system and everybody's happy because it's much faster. Everything's all hyperconverged. The problem that you'll run into is that with a hyperconverged infrastructure, you've got CPUs that are driving SQL Server, but you also have CPUs driving the storage layer. Those CPUs may not be configured correctly. You need to make sure that if you've got HCI or hyperconverged infrastructure, that your CPU that is driving the storage is not being shared with the CPU that is running SQL Server because they're very different access patterns. You want to make sure that your CPU is dedicated to SQL Server or if you can split off some of the CPUs to dedicate to SQL Server, that's preferred. So don't think that because your HCI has 20 CPUs that you can use all of them for SQL. You can't. Any questions about storage before I jump into network? I want to be cognizant of time as well. If not, oh, I see Ronan came off mute, so go ahead. No. I just want to say that you can continue. Okay, thank you. So let's talk about network. The, the one reason why it matters in the cloud today, why performance matters so, so much is because in the cloud, everything is connected over the network. It's software defined networking, so you don't know what's happening on the inside of Microsoft's network or Azure's network or Google's network. I'm not going to judge you unless you use Google. If you're using AWS or Azure or GCP or one of the many number of, of providers on in the cloud, you have to access it over the internet, or maybe you've got a dedicated VPN connection and you've got this dedicated line that's going straight into the data center. This is where distance matters. Distance matters a whole bunch. There is Microsoft's office in Toronto and Canada is nine milliseconds away nine milliseconds away from its data center. So the Azure Cloud and Microsoft's Office are nine milliseconds away. That's quick. That is very, very quick. 
But if you remember our original graph where I showed you a CPU clock cycle versus network access time, if a CPU cycle is one second, we're still talking nine months, right? So nine milliseconds might sound quick to you, but it really isn't. Every millisecond matters when it comes to the network. And what does reduce that is whatever's in memory or whatever's on disk that you're trying to read right back from the, from the application tier. Latency is your enemy in the cloud. There's no, no getting around that. The speed of light is the speed of the universe. We cannot go faster than that. A packet of network traffic that goes around the planet is going to take around 200 milliseconds. That's just how it's going to be. You cannot get faster than that. So when we talk about SQL Server, you always want less than 10 milliseconds, always. If, you're, if your application and your database are more than 10 milliseconds apart, you're going to feel that. You're definitely going to feel that if you've got, if you're busy migrating to the cloud and you do a lift and shift thing where you've got your application server running in a VM and you've got your SQL Server running in another VM and they're not talking to each other in the same area or the same region. This is especially noticeable when you have a failover. If they're not in the same region and there's more than 10 milliseconds, you're going to feel that. The human brain can comprehend about between 10 to 20 milliseconds. It's not. It's still too fast for us to know that something has happened, but we can start to feel that 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 distance in time, that latency. I say latency is the enemy, but your other enemy is DNS, the domain name system which is fraught with problems even today. Uh, there's, a, there's a meme a picture of it has been zero days since it was DNS. So DNS is always going to be a problem. You've got, aside from people doing misconfigurations, you've also got uh, poisoning. You've got all sorts of problems that DNS comes with. And if you're failing over, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to make sure that your TTL or time to live is low enough so that if you fail over, and you have an IP address that has changed, that your domain name that is pointing to that IP address can be updated quickly enough. So your TTL needs to be low, let's say five minutes, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, depending on your service level agreement. A lot of folks that I've spoken to who have had failovers that go badly, in many of the cases, it was because DNS didn't update fast enough. So the failover happened perfectly. It took 30 seconds to fail over, and then we had to wait an hour because of the, D the DNS. Yes, Ronan. Yeah, we have a very good question. Uh, is there a benefit to A record or a C name record? I'm going to answer that question by saying, is Mercedes Benz better than a Ferrari? They are pretty much equivalent. The problem is less about what, whether it's an A record or a C name. A C name is probably good enough. I would prefer an A record, but that's my preference. A C name is good enough. So for the folks who don't understand, a C name is basically a, a shortcut. Um, an A record might take longer to update. A C name is basically an alias or a shortcut like on a desktop to something. And I say C names in, on the slide because they're, they're, they're easier to set up. An A record might require a little bit more work to set up, but I prefer A records. What matters here is the TTL. You want to keep that below five minutes if you can for, so that your failovers are predictable. It's a great question. It depends. Other ways to speed up your network access are to reduce the amount of row by agonizing row operations. So Jeff Moden is a member of the community who's been contributing to SQL Server Central and various other websites for many, many years. Excuse me. And he has uh, this concept of, of rebar or row by agonizing row. If you're accessing data row by row, it's going to be slow because you're sending one row. Then your application is sending a response back to saying to SQL Server to say, thanks, I got that row, send me the next one. And then SQL Server sends the next row. And then it says, thanks, send me the next one. And you'll see that in your weight statistics as a async network IO. And that is the row by row thing. If you've seen, seen that async network weight stat, that's what it is. It's a row by row thing. Did you know, side note, that Microsoft SQL Server Profiler, remember Profiler kids? Profiler uses rebar. So if you've got Profiler running on your production server and you're accessing it from a client 
somewhere down the line, it's going to slow down. Profiler is going to slow down the whole of SQL Server because that's how it works. So if you do want to monitor your production server, don't use Profiler on, a, on your production server. And if you do use Profiler, use a trace file. Don't look at it in the, in the, in the uh, GUI. So that's just a side note about rebar. You want your set-based operations. So you want to operate on multiple rows at a time. That's what SQL Server is for, set-based operations. You also want to make sure that no count is turned on. No count means at the end of your little, at your query, it'll say 17 rows affected or 170,000 rows affected. That is a, a network message. So if you turn off no count, it doesn't need to send that. So it doesn't need to get an acknowledgement from the client to say, thank you, I got it. Don't use profile. Everything in the cloud is defined by the network. We've spoken about that. It's all about the distance between you and your data. If you can reduce the amount of data that you're reading using indexes, using set-based operations, using all of these tricks, then you will get your data to the customer faster. If you can have your application as a web server that is distributed over multiple regions, and you have some sort of way of getting read-only read uh, secondaries closer to your users, that's a good way of doing that. There are multiple ways, depending on your budget, how to get your data to your customers faster. But the best way to get your data fast is to make sure there's less of it in memory. If you're reading from the disk all the time, that's bad. Let's jump very quickly into virtual consumers. This is my name for VMs and containers because they're kind of similar, but not quite the same, but they're kind of are. Virtual consumers or VMs and containers are an abstraction layer between the operating system or the hardware and your database. And if you're running SQL Server in a container, it's a little bit closer to the hardware than if you're running SQL Server in a VM. You can run SQL Server in a Docker container. You can run SQL Server in a Kubernetes uh, orchestrated series of containers and pods and stuff like that. It's documented. It works well. There's a third party uh, thing that I'm not going to mention here because it's kind of Microsoft's thing and this is me presenting in my own name. But there are third party solutions where you can get your, your containers up and into the cloud and running SQL Server without worrying about data loss and things like that. Hyper-V isn't going away. Hyper-V is Microsoft's um, VM management tool. It's still there. You can still use that, even though there are other ways like VMware and Docker and so on who are market leaders. I mentioned Kubernetes briefly. Kubernetes or K8S because there are eight letters between the K and the S. Don't you love IT? Kubernetes is how you manage containers. OpenShift is Kubernetes. AKS or Azure Kubernetes Service is also Kubernetes. It's basically a way to manage your containers in a de software defined way. So if this container goes away, what is the rule? Do I replace it? Do I have to restore databases? Do I have to do something? What are those rules around what happens when a container goes away? That's what Kubernetes really is. If you have Linux knowledge, it will really help you if you're using containers. If you're thinking about containers and you only have one or two database servers, don't bother. Just keep running your SQL Server as a, as a regular machine. If you've got thousands and thousands of VMs and you're thinking of a way to consolidate, maybe you think containers will be better, that's when you think about containers. And I've just put a bullet point there saying that Windows containers do exist. Enough said. How do you manage all of this? What is in your broom closet? SQL Server Management Studio is probably the primary way of accessing SQL Server, and that is not going to change. And by the way, sometime next year, SQL Server Management Studio is going to have a 64-bit version. That's version 20 that's coming out sometime next year. Erin Stellato is the project manager or program manager for SSMS right now, and she has written blog posts about this and posted on the internet, on Twitter, about um, the fact that SSMS is going to have a 64-bit version, which means it's going to be less crashy. It's it's as a 32-bit application, it does crash a lot if you've got a lot of uh, large queries and stuff. So it is getting better. In the meantime, you can also use Azure Data Studio, which is getting better every month. If you haven't looked at Azure Data Studio in six months, I guarantee you there are some features you don't know about that you think are cool. So if you don't look at Azure Data Studio every month. Go and look at it today and see all the new features that are available and built in. And also remember that Azure Data Studio is cross-platform, so you can run it on Linux, you can run it on Mac OS, you can run it on Windows, and it has a whole bunch of extensions. 
Speaking of command line, SQL CMD, MS SQL CLI, which is not really a thing anymore, and BCP, which is the bulk copy program. Let's not worry too much about MS SQL CLI because SQL CMD just got a big update, something called Go SQL CMD. Well, SQL CMD that has been optimized. You can actually deploy a fully working container and open Azure Data Studio in two lines of command line scripting. Yes, Ronan, go ahead. That reminds that it's also open source and there is a lot of information and a lot of endings from the community. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Microsoft does embrace open source now. Uh, they never used to before, but yes, that is a very important point. And in fact, Ronan, as a presenter yourself, you'll know that I'll say that's an excellent point because I mentioned open source on the next page. So good job, Ronan. Thank you for, for that. SQL CMD, uh, Go SQL CMD is open source. Azure Data Studio, you can see the development of that in the, in, in the open as well. PowerShell is in the open. SQL Server module is the new way of doing it. If you ever did use SQL PS, it's obsolete, don't use it. You should be using SQL Server if you're writing PowerShell uh, modules. DBA tools, oh my goodness, if you've never heard of DBA tools, once this session is over, because I'm still speaking and I like the sound of my voice, go and look at dbatools.io, which is a website. Chrissy Lemire, who is a, a multi, thing MVP uh, has created this with a bunch of other folks and DBA tools is the way to manage more than one SQL Server instance, whether it be on um, directly on the machine, on the metal, or if it's in a VM or if it's in a container, all that kind of stuff. You can manage your SQL Server instances using DBA tools from a PowerShell script. It is amazing. And in if you're using in the cloud, Azure VMs, You've got the AZ PowerShell commandlets as well, which are very, very useful for managing stuff there too. Then SQL Server management objects, which is what SSMS uses to speak to your database, is now open source. So you can write your own code using SMO and it's open source. The query parser that SQL Server uses in SSMS to parse your queries to make sure that they're syntactically correct is also open source. And again, PowerShell is cross-platform. DBA tools can run on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Uh, SMO can run cross-platform. It's all good stuff. Open source is good. And now we're at the end of our session, so we'll talk, talk about questions. This is how to get hold of me if you're interested in talking uh, to me further. I spend most of my day on Microsoft Docs, which is on learn.microsoft.com slash SQL. And let's just do questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, we have a question that uh, just has come uh, for Azure support, uh, for Azure SQL uh, database. Would Azure CLI uh, users uh, is more, sorry, or is it more uh, matured uh, to be used than the PowerShell? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Is AZ CLI mature enough? I think it is, but if you're more comfortable in PowerShell, then use PowerShell. Use the tool that works for you. AZ CLI is being improved constantly, so there's always new improvements every month again. Um, and I think it is mature enough if you're working in Azure and you're working on the Azure stuff, then AZ CLI is great. If you're more familiar with PowerShell, use PowerShell. Um, Alex says, is there some technical documentation that you can point to me about this vCPU and hyperthreading recommendations from the, this presentation? Uh, not technical documentation, because we're currently working on the hyperthreading documentation. It hasn't been updated in many, many years, but I will say that Glenn Berry from, he formerly of SQL Skills, but he's now on SQL Server Performance, I think is the name of his blog. Um, Glenn, Glenn Allen Berry has written about vCPUs and hyperthreading. Um, I know that Jonathan Cahayas and Brent Ozar wrote about lock pages in memory a while ago, um, which is not quite the same thing. But the vCPU and hyperthreading thing is more about there is the, the the SQL documentation does have something about it, but it might be a little bit too technical. It was written by somebody who was very technical, and it's not that accessible. So try the SQL documentation and see if, if, if it makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know and we can we can make it easier to read. 
I don't, Yong, I see your question about the AZ700 exam. I don't know. I'm wondering how much content of the AZ700 is relevant to the networking knowledge required for handling SQL Server and Azure SQL. I don't know the answer to that because I've never written the A7, uh, AZ700. So thank you, Lazarus, uh, Keith Lazarus, for your comments about the documentation. As I said, there's only eight of us and 16,000 articles, so there is a lot that we have to get through, and it's not all good. It's it's old. A lot of the content is very old, and there just hasn't been a program manager at Microsoft to say, okay, let's focus on this area. So that's why a lot of the content might be might not be as relevant as it used to be. On-prem is on us, but does Azure have tuning diagnostics to help with getting system configurations correct? Steve, I think it's more about index tuning than, than anything else. But what with uh, what we're trying to get to, and this is not me speaking on behalf of Microsoft, this is me as a former MVP is saying, well, maybe this is where Microsoft is going. And I think it's not just Microsoft, it's, it's AWS as well. They want to abstract the data layer away from you so that if you're coming in as a developer and you don't care what your database looks like, you just want it to work the right way. And so what I think is gonna happen is that AWS, Microsoft, GCP, all of these are gonna have a, an abstraction layer that says, okay, well, this developer only needs to use this many CPU cycles, so we'll give them a smaller database. And as they grow, we'll give them something a little bit bigger, and then we'll create automatic indexes in the background, we'll manage the statistics for them. But that's a, a long way off, I think. Um, that's, that's, yeah, there are things in Azure that help you with index tuning and some performance things. In SQL Server itself, there's something called the query store, which is on by default in 2022 for new databases. That will help you diagnose slow performing queries and stuff like that. Definitely use query store, but it's, uh, and there's some features of that that are external to Azure SQL database that do the same thing. But that's probably the extent of it. And of course, you have the extent of the event, which is uh, supported in the Azure Square as well. Do we have any guys? Okay, then I a uh, web session. Uh, I don't, we will uh, move to the waffle so you can stay here uh, and uh, just wait uh, to have you with us. Morning. Thank Is you. Is it okay to stop the recording? Yes, it's great to stop the recording. I am. Um, I do have to go to a meeting which started 12 minutes ago, so unfortunately, I have to leave. But I appreciate I appreciate your time and thank you for um, your questions. They were very good questions, and let me know.